of vandalism in a small town. Buildings defaced, mailboxes and cars damaged. Tonight, deputies say two teens are responsible for spray painting churches, the library, even the post office in Oak Hill in Volusia County. News 6's Sachelle Sanders is live in Volusia County. And Sachelle, you spoke with some of the victims. What do they have to say? Well, Ginger, they definitely didn't say what you think they might have said. We uh, expected when we got down here that we would see graffiti like this painted all across the town. We knew there'd be some angry neighbors, but we didn't expect a lesson on forgiveness and community. The post office, the library, come on, the churches, stop signs. Uh, playground equipment. The tags were everywhere in small town Oak Hill. Sisters for Life smeared one building. I love you hearts on another. But other graffiti took a more sinister turn. Satanic. Uh, symbols and that type of thing. Jody Wheeler's car was trashed. Pentagrams, Satan is my daddy, and curse words sprayed across her 2014 Dodge journey. Welcome to hell! <laughs> to earthquakes, the big one could be coming soon and it could be closer to you than you think. Many people don't realize that North Alabama lies in the impact zone of a sleeping giant. The New Madrid fault line is 20 times bigger than California's San Andreas fault. And in just the last few weeks, activity in the zone starting to heat up. WHNT News 19's Nick Banizak joins us now with tonight's special report on the New Madrid fault line. Nick, I know you hit the road a couple of weeks ago, actually back to get to the bottom of what we're seeing and how it could impact us here in Alabama. So what are the odds of a New Madrid really mega quick? Well, guys, bottom line, it's a roll of the dice, but there are signs this fault line is awakening. Now, just two weeks ago, an earthquake centered in eastern Arkansas rattled residents in multiple states. That was the biggest quake to shake the New Madrid zone in several years, a zone North Alabama is a part of. And if past history is any indication, we could be in store for much larger earthquake activity in the near future. February 7th, 1812, 2 a.m. local time. America is asleep, unaware that disaster is about to strike. This is the biggest earthquake America ever saw. The ground shakes like never before, terrifying residents in the tiny town of New Madrid, Missouri, epicenter of the monster quake. When I went outside, people were screaming, running to and fro. Huge gaps in the earth would open, sometimes 15 feet wide. Then they would close again. It's a quake of historic proportions, and one that's felt in virtually every state in the Union at the time. What we know is that in 1811-1812, there was some damage in tall buildings or in taller structure in Charleston, South Carolina. So that's certainly farther away than Alabama. The 1812 quake was actually the third and final act in the trilogy of mega quakes that started in the New Madrid area two months earlier. Accounts of its intensity vary since there were no measuring instruments at the time, but most geologists say evidence shows it was at least a magnitude eight earthquake and possibly a nine or higher. 
Historians believe only a few hundred people likely died in a region that was sparsely populated at the time. But today, tens of millions live in the same impact area of what is now known as the New Madrid Seismic Zone, an eight-state swath that includes much of North Alabama. How many people do you think are actually aware in this region of the country of the potential danger coming from this new Madrid fault. I think most people are aware that earthquakes occur here, but they just can't remember the last time one shook them. Gary Patterson is a geologist with the Center for Earthquake Research and Information in Memphis. He calls the new Madrid zone a sleeping giant. You take the same magnitude earthquake, put one in California, one here. The one here is going to affect 10 to 20 times larger area. That's incredible. The geology of the central United States is much different than California. So earthquake energy spreads out very efficiently here. We know the earthquakes of 1811, 1812 were felt 1,000 or 1,200 miles away. A recent study conducted by FEMA rated 12 Alabama counties as code critical. Being in Lauderdale County, it's uh, sort of the point of impact for the state of Alabama, really. Tim Greer is deputy director of the Lauderdale County Emergency Management Agency. Depending on the size of a seismic event, our county itself could be a part of that uh, um, devastation. Greer and hundreds of other EMA directors in the New Madrid zone participated in a FEMA-run earthquake drill last year. The simulation model that FEMA used for its exercise was based on a 7.7 .7 magnitude quake. That may create some problems on some of the roads because they may uh, they may collapse or some of the bridges may collapse or something of that nature. The FEMA scenario projects that more than 900 people in Alabama would be injured in a 7.7 .7 New Madrid quake along with almost 30 killed. What is the worst case scenario for a, a mega quake in the New Madrid fault zone? The worst case scenario for a large earth, for earthquake hazard here in the central United States is a sequence of earthquakes, not just one. So it's one thing to be prepared for a magnitude seven. But if you have three magnitude sevens within a three month period with 12, 15 magnitude sixes on top of that, and thousands of magnitude fours and fives in between, that's a whole different story. Cumulative damage from earthquake sequences. Some unsettling news today from Antarctica. Penguins, everyone's favorite waddling animal, could be in trouble due to man-made global warming. Penguins like it cold, but warming water and shrinking sea ice could lead to a 60% decline in the population of the Adelie penguin by, 2019, by 2099, according to a study that just came out today. For millions of years, natural climate change has affected Adelie penguins across Antarctica as glaciers expanded and melted. Warm periods actually were beneficial as shrinking glaciers allowed them to return to their rocky breeding grounds. But this study concludes that any recent helpful warming may have reached its tipping point. We know the Adelie penguin population declines are due to warming, which suggests that many parts of Antarctica have warmed too much and that further warming is no longer good for the species, one of the study authors said. The study appeared in the journal Scientific Reports and was led by scientists from the University of Delaware. A separate study in 2009 reported that another penguin species, the emperor penguin, could also face extinction by 2100 as Antarctic sea ice melts. Okay, Betty, thanks a lot. Zika fears are growing in South Florida and new today, the first baby in the state where the virus was born here. And two new cases of Zika reported in Miami-Dade County. Let's get to Local 10's Glenn Milberg on top of the story for us today, and she's live now with more. Glenna. A few new cases in Broward County as well and in Palm Beach. Calvin Zika is adding up in Florida, especially now that there is a baby born with microcephaly. This is a travel related case. A woman from Haiti who came here to have that baby and all of this on the same day as Zika funding. The funding to actually fight Zika is stuck in a partisan Congress. But now we're up to 187 cases, our first microcephaly case. 
The first baby born in Florida with Zika-related microcephaly is born to a Haitian woman who traveled here to give birth. She contracted Zika in Haiti, health officials say. Her newborn is the third U.S. microcephaly birth following babies born in Hawaii last December and in Hackensack, New Jersey last month. A photo of that little girl, whose mother is from Honduras, shows the brain and skull deformity microcephaly causes, leading to a lifetime of damage and developmental delay. I've asked the CDC to do another phone call uh, with all of our health care providers uh, so they can continue to educate uh, the public. The governor has allocated $26 million in emergency state funding, much of it to control the mosquito population, the primary source of Zika transmission. More than a billion dollars in federal funding for that and research and vaccine development, that is stuck in partisan politics. I'll tell you what shameful is. That's allowing more women of childbearing age to contract the Zika virus so their babies can end up looking like this. This morning, the Senate failed to move $1.1 billion for Zika funding. This time, Democrats blocked a Republican bill that included cuts to programs and policies they favored. In prior tries, House Republicans failed to meet the Zika funding the president favored. And this morning's hearing in the House was seen as the very last chance to get anywhere with Zika funding before the summer mosquito season. And that is especially worrisome in this state because, you know, the Olympics are in Brazil. The summer Brazil is where Zika is a real epidemic. And of course, Miami International and Fort Lauderdale's international airports are seen to be two places where a lot of people are going to be traveling from Brazil into this country and the other way for the Olympics. Well, now to a disturbing story out of Arizona where two former TV reporters in Tucson are facing charges after police say they their baby tested positive for cocaine. Some Chai Lucy and his wife, Kristen, are accused of snorting cocaine and then breastfeeding the infant the day after. The 26 year old mom told officials that her baby's eyes were rolling and she became very lethargic and limp. They both pleaded not guilty to a list of charges, including child abuse, possession of a dangerous drug, and drug paraphernalia. The baby is now living with a grandmother. The Supreme Court has rejected a religious rights appeal from pharmacists in Washington state. They say their, they say their faith prohibits them from dispensing Plan B or other drugs that may cause abortion. More than 35 pharmacy organizations supported the pharmacist's rights, but the Washington state government has told them their licenses will be revoked if they refuse to carry the morning after pill. Now the Supreme Court has rejected their case. They'll have to comply. Justice Samuel Alito is calling it, quote, an ominous sign about the state of religious liberty. some major U.S. airports. Chris Van Cleve is at Reagan National near Washington. Chris, good morning. Good morning. Airports take a layered approach to security. Some of that is just visibility, but as you get closer to the checkpoints, you're going to see more and more layers of security. That said, this is all a public place. Anyone can be here, and that's part of the vulnerability. If you're traveling this holiday weekend, don't be surprised to see a more visible police presence at airports. Some of the busiest air travel hubs in the U.S. have bolstered security after the apparent Istanbul terror attack. In the New York City area, there's a visible increase in officers with tactical weapons at all three major airports. In Miami, police will patrol curbside areas for suspicious vehicles. And at LAX in Los Angeles, security was already stiffened ahead of the 4th of July weekend, with an increase in canine units and officers on foot. Over 3 million Americans are expected to fly over the holiday. 
The attack on Istanbul's Ataturk airport is again raising concerns about soft targets in public areas of airports, similar to the terror attack that hit the Brussels airport in March, which killed 16 people. There's no one-size-fits-all answer. John Pistol is the president of Anderson University and a former head of the TSA under the Obama administration. Istanbul is a, a secure airport with lots of layers of security. Public side is what has been attacked most recently as opposed to what they call the sterile side, where the planes are. And so it's a whole different paradigm that police, security, intelligence, and aviation specialists are looking at. Security at American airports typically increases as travelers approach the TSA checkpoints, but that could leave many travelers in public areas vulnerable to an attack. And Pistol says that is nearly impossible to stop. It can be perhaps just seconds after somebody gets out of a car or a taxi, in this case, walks into the, the public side of the terminal and starts the attack. It's very, very difficult to stop that in each and every instance. In a statement to CBS this morning, the Department of Homeland Security says it is monitoring the situation in Turkey and directing appropriate actions as the facts warrant. Immediately we hear ISIS and think, oh, Middle Eastern uh, attackers, when no, this is, you know, as Michael's been explaining, the horizons have expanded. Well, absolutely, Allison. And if you ask most Syrians uh, why they hate ISIS so much, obviously there's a myriad of reasons, their brutality first and foremost. But one of the other things that you'll hear from many Syrians is we hated them because they weren't Syrian. Uh, this wasn't a Syrian organization. It was sort of born in Iraq in Camp Bucca, which was this uh, American prison. Um, but then it became huge, essentially, because it acted as a sort of center of gravity for all of these jihadis oh. who poured in from across the world. And, and as you heard Michael say there, uh, Central Asia, former countries, former Soviet Union satellite states, these are some of the most uh, significant contributors to the jihad and specifically to ISIS. And they are also known, particularly the Chechens, as being some of the most brutal and battle-hardened fighters, Allison. Hmm. U.S.-led coalition aircraft have waged a series of deadly strikes against the Islamic State's targets in Iraq. The strikes south of the city of Fallujah are estimated to have killed at least 250 suspected ISIL fighters and destroyed 40 vehicles. If the figures are confirmed, the strikes would be the most deadly against the jihadist group. The U.S.-led campaign against the Islamic State has moved up a gear in recent weeks, with the government declaring victory over the militant group in the city of Fallujah. An alliance of militia has also launched a major offensive against the Islamic State in the north of Syria, in the city of Manbij. The U.S. destroyer's close encounter with a Russian warship in the Mediterranean Sea has triggered a war of words between the two countries. Russia's defense ministry says the American destroyer violated international agreements by swerving dangerously past the Russian warship. The ministry says the incident shows the U.S. Navy's ignorance towards the consequences of, a danger, of dangerous maneuvering in regions with intense navigation. Meanwhile, a U.S. defense official has reacted to the criminal statements, accusing the Russian warship of carrying out an unsafe and unprofessional maritime operation near two U.S. Navy ships on June 17th. Tensions have been running high between the two navies since April when a Russian reconnaissance plane made a flyby past a U.S. destroyer in the Baltic Sea. How'd you get to 